Hello, hello everybody. Can you can you hear me? Okay. Hello, hello, hello. Thanks for coming and thanks uh, for your interest in. <laughs> Maybe it's too early. Maybe let's wait a bit. <laughs> many thanks for coming, and uh, I see many very esteemed colleagues and artists in the in the, in the public. So. Um, it's still a bit noisy. We have to adapt finally. It's, yeah, it's coming from outside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. So um, many thanks also to Paris Photo for inviting us. Many thanks uh, to Anna Blanas and her colleagues. And I would like now to introduce our the subject with the title "New Ways of Collecting." Um, new ways of collecting photography, recent practices, and acquisition. Maybe we can also add new contents and to the new forms. So new ways and new contents of collecting uh, recent practices and acquisitions. And first of all, I would like to introduce to my colleagues, first of all, Tamara Bergmanns sitting here. Um, she has worked as a collection curator at FOMU, Photo Museum Antwerp since 2010. She curates the collection exhibition and is responsible for the acquisition policy. In 2008, she completed her PhD dissertation on Belgian subjective photography. She is the author of The Making of a Photo Book, Tane Sané's Maquette for a Diary of an Erotomaniac, Maniac, for an er Erotomaniac, sorry published by Rijksmuseum Studies in Photography in 2009. The, a, the Eye of the Photographer, 2011. Looking for Love on the Left Bank, 2013. Photography uh, Incorporate, 2015. To the Embo, 2017. And Photobook Belge, from 1854 uh, until now, from 2019. And sitting beside, Beside Tamara is Thomas Selig. He studied visual communication at the Fachhochschule Bielefeld, followed by a curatorial study program at the Jan van Eyck Academy in Maastricht. He joined the Photo Museum Winterthur team in 2003 as a collection curator. So both are collection curators or work as collection curators. And was co-directing the Photo Museum from 2013 till 2017. Thematic exhibitions he curated were, for example, The Ecstasy of Things in 2004, Research and Invitation, or uh, Concrete Architecture and Photography. Since 2018, Thomas has been head of the photographic collection at Museum Volkwang in Essen. And since he has curated exhibition on Marge Monko, Anne Biermann, Paul Koiker, uh, Shuam Gupta, Topoes Ziloni, and Tim Rautert, he is also in the public among other shows, and also uh, Image Capital, something which uh, links us uh, for the moment. I would propose we start immediately with the three presentations of our recent acquisitions, and then we go on discussing. Uh, Thomas, you have the floor. Okay, yeah, welcome also from my side. Uh, we have uh, agreed on a kind of 10-minute presentation. I hope that I keep the pace and we have uh, further time to uh, discuss. As uh, Florian has said, um, uh, uh, I'm working as a head of the collection of uh, um, Museum Volkwang, and of course it has a history and everything which we are doing nowadays is uh, linked and incorporated, of course, to what has been uh, done in the past. The, the history of the museum, uh, of the photographic collection is about 50 years old. It started basically with Otto Steinart as somebody who was invited to do shows at the museum. Um, and 1978, when he died, it was Ute Eskilsen for uh, more than three decades who kind of formed the collection. And then it was uh, Florian, actually, uh, in Essen before I came there. So everybody brought in a curtain, certain kind of history. And uh, what we are dealing now here is actually uh, recent practices of uh, doing acquisitions. And um, uh, that's why I start with uh, uh, the exhibition space, which is actually for many who have been in Essen, know that it's in the lower floor of the museum. It's a very um, horizontal museum, which has a lower um, exhibition space. And it was for more than 30 years, the place where major exhibitions of photography has taken place. And we have since about four years uh, re-directed um, uh, this space for 
new acquisitions in relations to uh, our collection. So it's always a dialogue between something which is coming new into the collection and referring, of course, to uh, what has been um, uh, collected in the past. What we see here is an acquisition uh, 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 with, um, actually at that time there were, I would say, more posters. You see that, that they were kind of stick to the wall uh, of Paul Koika. He has a, a stand here with uh, Ter Megan, Ter Wigen, I don't know what the gallery, the, the, the Dutch gallery, Tevigen Bosch, that's the name of the gallery. Uh, and here you see, of course, uh, they are um, they are addition. They ha have a kind of certain um, idea about the market. But at that time, actually, I was acquiring him because he didn't have an idea if that would be a photographic work considered in the art world or if this would be a kind of documentation um, in the maybe in the fashion world. And there is this kind of link, of course, uh, to discuss to what kind of uh, world this belongs. So it was maybe a year of um, uh, back and forth before we kind of uh, made the acquisition. And then it was also the invitation to him uh, to look how um, actually um, uh, our collection could respond. And here you see, it's probably a little bit too detailed. You see his response to that. He went uh, into uh, the archives and he brought uh, like work, for example, Lisette Model, Jürgen Teller, uh, Florence Henry, uh, Cindy Sherman. And uh, that was actually a kind of um, uh, face to face um, his work and also the strength of, uh, for example, uh, surrealism part in his work and also in our collection. Um, we acquired a work from Anne Schmidt and Andre Steinbach. It was a street that raised me, street that paid me, streets that made me a product of my environment. It's actually their final exam work from the Hochschule in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, Leipzig. And for a long time, it was actually laying apart. And actually, it was a, uh, also a kind of uh, strategic decision to acquire a um, analog slideshow in a time where actually this um, form actually is kind of disappearing. And we had big problems, even we acquired it maybe like four years ago, that nowadays it's very hard to get replications in analog form for these kind of slides. And they were made now for this exhibition, an exhibition set, but most probably the last analog version of this slideshow. And here it is connected in uh, uh, one of the collection presentation uh, with works of uh, Edouard Baldus, you see on the right side, which has, of course, very, um, how to say, very um, uh, conservative um, conditions, how you could show it. And here it was actually very good to bring the light down, to show both the slideshow and to be responsible also for the uh, elevation of this work. Uh, one of the recent acquisitions which we made is uh, that of Rafael Milach, Rafał Milach, the, uh, the uh, uh, Polish photographer, and he is not only a, a full-time member of Magnum, but he's also very active um, in, uh, uh, in Poland with, uh, for example, Sputnik Photo. It's, it's a group of uh, photographers which are connecting there. And a very loose form was actually the archive of public protests, which arose in around 2016 in Poland when the PES came into power. And at that time, it was uh, a very big, um, um, uh, there was a kind of certain energy in uh, the society to fight against uh, the oppression, which was actually given place by the PES. And since then, there were many protests, many forms of protests, but also different topics of uh, protests. So here it was uh, um, uh, the free choice protest, which is still going on for now, I would say, eight years. And uh, they have made uh, um, newspapers out of that. And the newspapers were actually a way to combine these topics to form a new kind of content, which is opposite uh, the content, which was distributed by the right wing or the right wing oriented media. So there was a kind of counter um, public, which they wanted to create. And for that purpose, they worked together as the archive of public protest. It was not Milach himself only, but he kind of invited or kind of um, uh, uh, brought together 17 other people who were um, contributing. And uh, for us, it was actually 
a um, uh, a moment where we acquired actually first time in the history of the museum data only. Uh, and out of these data, we um, actually generated this exhibition, which is on view um, at the moment in uh, our exhibition space. Um, we have even a more, how to say, a more um, experimental um, um, a format in the museum, which is a space which is, has a size of about uh, 35 square meters. And we invited the artist Vincent Beekman uh, in 2022 because he was working with a group of homeless people in uh, Brussels. And it was a kind of, Beekman is from Belgium, and I think he's also part of your presentation later, Tamara. And we invited him to uh, uh, propose something, and he basically proposed to exhibit uh, the works of um, the um, homeless people, which were given cameras um, constantly. They photographed their environment, friends, and things like that. And then they together were kind of um, uh, curating the show and also piling together what should be visible for the exhibition. So it was a project which had a starting at an end and we kind of decided to say we want to collect this complete uh, group of works. It went after the presentation as a kind of remain um, of our exhibition um, um, history and I think that is also maybe one trace you can see in exhibition policies or collecting policies that, that it might be a good reason to combine these kind of uh, effects uh, um, uh, here and there. And it's important here that it's not Vincent Beckmann who is uh, on number one in this exhibition title, but it's Le Crux. There are four people at that time which were uh, uh, contributing, and you see uh, my colleague um, uh, um, uh, here uh, working together with the people to both do the exhibition but also uh, uh, contributing to this um, uh, to this uh, wall drawings which we see at the right. Um, recent acquisition which we were doing was also just in Kurland, Frauen. It's a um, photo collage. Uh, it's actually a, a collage of a photo book which was cut off by uh, Justin Kurland. It's actually a series which she kind of developed to say, I want to uh, deaccession my uh, male-oriented uh, uh, photo uh, library. The history of photography is quite male-oriented, and she wanted to kind of say um, there are counter possibilities, and actually the manifesto um, uh, incorporates a lot of uh, cut-off books now at the moment, and Frauen is relating to uh, the book which she has cut off. It's uh, from Michael Schmidt, and uh, we have chosen this because we also have works in the collection by Michael Schmidt, so there are these kind of uh, uh, two counterparts. Helen Chadwick, it's also a feministic position where we acquired uh, this uh, portfolio in the kitchen. Um, an important point into the future is, I guess, dealing with the uh, digital image. Uh, here it's Tamara Janes' poor image, which is, of course, a reference to uh, Hito Steil, and uh, it's uh, one of the first images where she was kind of, uh, kind of, um, blurring and also kind of breeding uh, new images which have uh, not a kind of documentary approach but they are kind of uh, uh, things coming together. Uh, time is running fast. 2016 was a time where uh, these were the aesthetics and I would say when we are looking at poor images of, uh, um, uh, of her it's completely different. Um, Anno Kreutov is a video work which we have acquired, a uh, seven-part video installation. In this case, it's quite interesting that Anouk was actually working together with a group of, I think, 50 researchers all over the world. So it's a very global, it's a very um, uh, kind of also post-colonial attitude to say, like, we are incorporating uh, into the research of finding clips of different um, 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 uh, um, YouTube videos, which were then put together into this work, Universal Tonk, which is also accessible through a website where you can also see the videos, but also the research about the dance, uh, which, was a, um, which was researched. Um, my last project I want to present is of Raphael Rosendahl. It's a non-photographic uh, project, it's an NFT, a uh, project where only data were incorporated, but of course here 81 Horizons 
uh, could be very much connected to uh, Hiroshi Sugimoto, which we're seeing here down the aisle, for example. But the interesting part here in this presentation uh, was actually that we wanted to stress the new uh, circumstances that uh, exhibitions and maybe also collections could be purely digital uh, and uh, what does it affect? The, the boundary between um, uh, the blockchain and a museum structure um, arouse certain uh, problematics and we have not acquired works from Rosendahl or from NFT World, but it's something where we want to stress a learning uh, curve. We are working together with specialists from the different fields just to kind of get into this because we know that this will be the future and we have to get a relation to that. Thank you. Any thanks, Thomas? Perfect. Tamara, would you would go on and I, I will we jump discuss into later. it immediately. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Um, I will tell you more about the new directions we are going with our collection policy. Uh, the photo museum in Antwerp started collecting as of 1965, so quite early, and today houses over four million photographs, cameras, objects, books. Uh, compared to the, my colleagues here, we are a medium-specific museum, so another photo photography department of a, another institution, so it's a little bit different. Um, our collection is both international and Belgian, spanning from the beginning of photography until present day, going from autonomous artistic photography to documentary photography to vernacular photography, so it's wide. Um, before I will show you examples, I will tell you a little bit more about um, how our uh, approach to collecting alongside with how society has changed, with our uh, ways of collecting have, have radically changed too. And an important question uh, we ask ourselves is, how do we make a collection relevant for a contemporary audience? Not only in acquisition, but also in presentation uh, of this collection. Another question is, how do we make our collection uh, sustainable? How can we lower our carbon footprint? And I think not only us, but I think every institution should look at themselves very critically and, and question the old ways of collecting things because think about the future generations. Um, so these are only a few of the issues we've been working around the last uh, years uh, in the museum. But uh, when we uh, reviewed our acquisition policy over the last 10 years, what became apparent is that we acquired little work of um, artists of color and of women photographers. I think we're not the only one. So uh, a great deal of work still has to be done to, ach to achieve a diversified uh, policy that is balanced in terms of gender, uh, color and background. And that's why we um, chose to rethink the ways that we are acquiring uh, works. And we actually, uh, we came up, it's not like that, we, we, um, we made four criteria for the whole uh, museum. So for the programmation, the exhibitions, but also for the um, collection um, acquisitions. So everything that we buy has to meet these four criteria. I will just give these four criteria. And then I will also give some examples of um, the last years. So uh, we collect uh, historical and present day subjects that are relevant, interesting and recognizable for a contemporary audience. Uh, photographs that encourage reflection um, on issues of society today and that also fuel the public debate. We choose subjects that contribute to a multi-voiced view of the photograph of the photographic image, but also of the world. So we actively are searching for different perspectives. Also keep in mind with, with our own uh, colonial uh, history, also uh, communities that are present uh, in Belgium. We, we focus uh, on, on these photographers. Think about Sami Balogi, Muslam Rabat, Leonard Pongo. Uh, we also choose photographers that are who look critically to the, photo to the medium of photography or the history uh, of photography. And uh, we also really look at the ethical position of the photographers and the subjects. So we always question what is the impact and what is the context of the images that we show or that we uh, acquire. 
And what we see is that working with these criteria led to a more inclusive approach to the uh, collection that also reflects in a better way the, uh, the diversity of the society. Of course, we are not there yet. Uh, we're really, it's a work in progress, but we already feel that it's something that the whole museum really um, is supporting and everybody is, yeah, everybody is uh, working with it. Um, now I will also show some images, of course. Um, um, if we look at a few recent acquisitions, uh, I would like to start with uh, a work by Alison Rosser, who is also present here, um, because uh, Thomas was already talking about it, about his uh, co connection with the collection that is already there, with the historical collection. And uh, the photo museum, we have the, um, the historical Achva Gevaert photographic company archive in our collection. And uh, that uh, the Gevaert uh, company was also very important in the creation of the photo museum. So we're looking for contemporary artists who are uh, reflecting or working or giving a contemporary take on this historical collection. I think this uh, work by Alison with the Geva, Geva Lux Velour paper um, is a very good example of how we can do that. Um, Another uh, connection with uh, our collection and also with Achva uh, Gevert is uh, James Barner. Uh, we are, James Barner, we are showing a new retrospective of him right now in Antwerp, so uh, please come and have a look. But uh, James Barner was also um, following the Color School in 1969 in Morsel in Antwerp. And he was a representative of Achva Gevert in Ghana, so we cho which also chose a few uh, of his color images. This is uh, one example. So that there's also, it's not only a post-colonial story we're telling, but we're also telling the story of the of the collection. Another example, uh, Lucas Leffler, I'm, uh, where, for example, you see here on the right, uh, one of his uh, mud prints that is made with the mud that he found in the Silver Creek behind the Gevert company. That's also a question about the materials, uh, organic materials. You don't know what you what's going to happen with that print uh, later on. Um, another example, um, what we're doing now is assignments uh, with uh, the collection. Uh, I, I said we're not only thinking about acquisition, but also presenting the collection in a different way. So we're opening up our collection exhibitions also to new perspectives, new voices. And for example, uh, last year we invited the British Kenyan artist uh, Grace Inderitu to go in dialogue with our collection. We gave her carte blanche, she could make a collection exhibition, but it always, these exhibitions always start with work that we have of that particular artist in our collection. And uh, a few years before we bought A Quest for Meaning, the work that you see here, it's a photographic installation. Um, Grace works with shamanism as a ways of um, reactivating collections. It's a non-rational um, encyclopedia of the of the universe from the Big Bang until now. She's working with intuition, and she really used this work that we bought also to look at our collection in a different way. Another artist. Uh, this is a, a self-portrait by uh, Dirk Braakman. Uh, no, this is just a portrait by Dirk because uh, Dirk Braakman is also his. He got the same assignment, so he will be guest curating of the collection show, and he's also making new work, a whole series of thirty prints that are inspired on the vernacular FOMU collection. So the work is in progress uh, and will be ready next year. Um, when we talk about different uh, materials, um, other experimental experimental formats. Here you see an example uh, by uh, Dominique Somers. It's not a print, it's uh, like a neon tube lightning that she made uh, actually because she did a PhD on uh, la flashlights in, in history photography. And what you see here is what the, the eye movement, what it makes when the flash hits your eye. So it's also something for us as a photo museum, something new as a way of um, conserving. Of course, your guys are working in contemporary in art museums, so you're used to it. 
Another interesting uh, work is uh, the trophy camera by Max Pinkers and Drieze Porter. It's an uh, AI, artificial intelligence powered camera without viewfinder, without screen. And it has been trained by all the previous winning world press photos of the year. It's a camera that people can use in the exhibitions. It's our most popular loan object, but of course it raises questions on software, hardware, uh, it always has to be updated for a collection. It's a beautiful, uh, it's a very interesting uh, object, but it's also very difficult for a collection who is used to working with just dead cameras and pictures on a wall. The same can be said from this uh, uh, surveillance uh, speaker. Um, that's a rotating camera that describes what it sees, also with the use of our artificial intelligence. A few years ago, we also bought works of uh, Zanele Muholi and uh, Melanie Bonayo, and I'm showing these works also because, just as uh, Thomas was talking, we also bought the digital files, because they're wallpapers, so it's site-specific, so depending on how and when we're showing them, they will change. It's also for the first time that we just buy the digital files instead of just the print. I would like to end my uh, presentation with two different types of uh, archives. Uh, we already talked about Vincent Beekman. This is a project where he's a curator of, not the photographer, but it's some kind of nomadic museum made by 130 wooden boxes and it's an interactive performance so Vincent puts it somewhere people can only look at the boxes when he takes the box and explains what's in the box so we're working now with artist interviews to see okay how can in 50 years in 100 years when Vincent is not there anymore how can we still uh, use it and the last uh, archive that we didn't acquire yet, but that we are investigating what we can do with it, is a Belgian Solutions by David Helbig. It's an online social media archive where David Helbig, a German artist, he's the founder on the, of the concept and the title. And it started with his pictures of Belgian solutions that he found everywhere in 2008, but nowadays it's an archive of more than 1,000 images. It's an open source archive. Everybody is still sending these archives to Facebook, Instagram. How will we, as, as an institution, deal with these, kinds, these types of um, artistic objects? You can't use them, but artistic uh, archives. So that's a challenge, I think, for the future. Many, many thanks. <laughs> Um, I, I think we will um, raise the question of sustainability also later in our discussion. Maybe you'd have to check my 10 minutes if you can have a look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, I think it's a very good idea, Tamara, to, to define the criteria, um, the criteria of, um, of collecting. I think it's a very interesting idea. It's more difficult if, if you're working at a big machine like the Centre Pompidou. Which this has a very complex relationship between all the departments and um, for sure also for us it's um, very important and maybe the main task is to you have a wonderful collection you have to do an interpretation of what is in this collection and how um, how relevant is what is in the collection for the future so to 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 kind of to think about acquisitions which in a way can dialogue with what is in the collection and in the same time is also concerning um, the questions of today. So maybe a very well-known um, artist, Jochen Lempert, and we did an acquisition of these artists also in response to what we have uh, in the collection regarding surrealist um, art, uh, uh, Jean Painlevé, and other biomorphical sculptures, paintings, and at the same time, and I think this is also something which is very important right now at the museum as a big topic to redefine our relationship between uh, with or between humans and animals, humans and nature. So this, in this sense, I think a very interesting acquisition for us. Um, it's also, I think, what we, um, Judy Jones, my, my colleague and all the other colleagues at the 
and at the photography department, we are still convinced of that in photography, we can still find uh, important ensembles. Um, let's say even archives, even if this also raises the question of sustainability, but I think we also have to think what, what is, deserves as an archive to be collected. This is not an archive, but this is an important ensemble responding to this important surrealist tradition. And this was a book dummy. So we are very interested by these kind of um, defined ensembles, which can, in a way, also um, in dialogue with uh, Fernand Leger painting, um, can in a way um, be strong enough to to have it in the same space like a, like a painting on the ensembles like Si Contre is one example. If we go on, uh, another um, archive we, we acquired to give an idea um, is um, an archive by a French philosopher, um, Paul Virilio and his series Bunker Archaeologie, so more than 750 black and white prints. And this also, in a way, um, means acquiring um, this archive is also to underline um, the Pompidou's um, interdisciplinary um, pretension or, or claim to, to have this dialogue between thinkers and um, photographers. And this way, uh, a thinker started this photography, and this photography was important for, for his thinking about visuality and and war technology until um, today. So a, a very big issue for us is also the question how we can approach, um, how we can uh, decolonize our, our collection. And um, maybe <laughs> if I show you some examples, um, it's not 80%, it's just maybe 20% or even not, but it's just a starting point. And I think for a French collection, it's a very important thing. And we have to have also many voices in this process of decolonizing our collection. So we acquired from the, from the um, Camera Austria and the Fondation Bourdieu um, the archive uh, of uh, the Algerian years um, of this French philosopher and sociologist. Uh, who started in 1957 uh, till 61 to really work in Algeria. And uh, photography, again, was so important for all his thinking about field research. Um, to continue, so this is also an important ensemble, and this was only possible by the help of our friends. And this, I think, will also be a subject of our discussion. Um, this is... Um, uh, again, a book dummy like like Si Contre, and, and this time it's hairstyles by uh, the Nigerian photographer Chidi Okai Ochekere, and um, so in this sense a, a major acquisition. Uh, we long we worked long together um, also with the family and with the gallery on this acquisition. Um, and if I continue, we also just to give an example, I, I like a, a lot your approach, James Barner. So we um, also would like to identif um, ident um, intensify um, our research in photography from West Africa. My, my colleague, uh, Damaris Amao, uh, yes, entered this piece, um, this um, uh, ensemble of 15 photographs by James Barner into our collection. Another, um, another example um, are, um, is the work by Mathieu uh, Abonin, Kleibe Abonin, a contemporary artist, um, and his deconstruction of this uh, sculpture, um, uh, so a totally contemporary uh, approach. So you have this variety of voices um, thinking about how um, we can also, in a way, these post-colonial approaches having these different ways of re reflecting. So it's showing um, the, the one who was very important for the abolishing slavery, um, Victor Schlöcker, um, but a very paternalist sculpture. And this work is, in a way, deconstructing the sculpture or another approach is Tara Krasnak. Um, and also between post-colonial, she is a, a woman coming from Peru, born in Peru, and uh, also a way of deconstructing now a feminist approach to 
um, the, the nudes by Edward Weston. You can see these pieces right now in the Korakor exhibition. So um, maybe um, Thomas, uh, I think, gave a lot of examples how to think about now this new visual digital culture. Um, very interesting what you're doing with NFTs. My colleagues, Marcella Lista and Philippe Bettinelli, did, I think, a very interesting um, acquisition on 60 a NFT works. And all of these NFT works are also, in a way, questioning the NFT market, you know, in a sense. This is now a piece by Andrew Norman Wilson with the Google scans up. So what you can see is that the, our digital world is not totally virtual. It's also a social context behind. And you see the scans ups of the people who are scanning the books for, uh, for Google and the Google library. And there are often people of color who are scanning these books. Another piece right now, uh, Trevor Paglen. And we did this acquisition not only now for Cora Cor, but we will show this work. We try to show this work in a show at Centre Pompidou, Shanghai, uh, next year. And we will see if the Chinese, if the Chinese censorship will allow this work, which is in a way um, questioning um, um, the, the new um, techniques of facial recognition systems, um, which are highly problematic. Something I would like also maybe to discuss with you later. We did um, um, uh, a very nice um, acquisition of this uh, photo manual by Sarah Zwiner, and this was a shared acquisition with uh, the SF MoMA. So there was only one set um, available, and the artist uh, told us she would only have one, uh, keep it together for an institution. So we were looking for another institution and we could share it with uh, Clément Cherou at the time at the SF MoMA. So maybe this could also be strategies um, for, for the future. Uh, and other, I should go on, yeah. Um, you mentioned both these now, these works of keeping files and working now, um, I think it's also new for us, it's not new for the colleagues of the new, new, new media department, to, um, to work with protocols. So to have protocols for photography, it's not one um, 30 by 40 print, but it's now a digital file and it can be adapted to a print or it can be adapted. So we have with Mohamed Borouissa uh, for this wonderful series done with Anuka Shoot, um, a major, or his first photographic series, a protocol, and we uh, can adapt the form for the different purposes we have. And I see also sitting in the public, Susan Maiselas, and we <laughs> did a wonderful acquisition of a work um, called The Life of an Image. And this is also something new because we would like to define the work. It's an ongoing series, something um, um, around her a work, Molotov Man in 1979 in Nicaragua. And she was the one, in a way, as artist and curator to collect all these images around the Molotov Man. And it's still ongoing. So photography is not only a fixed black and white print, but it's something ongoing. And many thanks. And uh, yeah. okay, perfect. So this is so um, yeah. I, and now it's just it's just, just the beginning. It's just the beginning. Um, I, I think what is very interesting now for us. So I think we have discussed also the new contents. We have now also um, discussed these new um, digital forms. What I think interesting is also because it's a question for all of us um, to uh, raise the questions of the sites um, and the, the work by Arne Schmidt and Angie Steinbach. So we are between something which is having totally new digital forms, but we have also um, photography becoming obsolete, obsolete forms, vanishing forms, fading away print. Um, we are just discussing now to reserve an important part of the budget to replace all these fading away chromogenic prints. Um, what, is, what is your way to think about these, um, these things? Do you, this is an important matter of discussion, these fading away matters of the, of the collection and um, what, is, what is your yeah, state of the art? Yeah, good question. I think it's an open question for... Uh, um, uh, I think in, in color photography in general, um, I would say we are on this verge where we have to kind of, uh, uh, I think you brought it up with a protocol that 
things will be changing anyways while things will be replaced. And uh, that would mean actually even a color photograph which had not that protocol might additionally be added with that protocol to say there might be a transformation. Because technically, I mean, you mentioned Aqua favored as an, as an archive. The company doesn't exist anymore. Ciba Chrome doesn't exist anymore. Uh, some printer, uh, like uh, uh, hardware facility printers, will not work anymore, will not be uh, 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 available with uh, new uh, items to replace things or so. So there will be a technical, um, uh, uh, what is like, fading away of certain techniques. But on the other hand, I would say that always happened to photography. I mean, it's, not, it's nothing new over the course of the history. So basically, it's something maybe we are in a generation where we have a higher feeling of loss. And maybe that's, that's the issue. And I think it's okay to have this feeling of loss, but that's also inherent to photography that things will change, even if you preserve an image in the best possible way in a fridge, whatever, or in a, in, in, in a freezer. They will change. Photographs will die, maybe. Maybe we will not see them die, but maybe they will. But <laughs> is that such a bad thing? That's just the way of life. We can only preserve them in the best possible ways. And then still we have to think about how much money, how much energy do you want to put in conserving something that will change? And for example, changing, um, even if it's possible to change uh, a color print that has been faded, is it necessary? If the photographer is still alive, they will say, yes, I want to, have, I want to show a, a better image of what we have, but... I think if the photographer is alive, this is a, this is a question that you have, will have to have with him. I don't think we would buy a new print, but if the photographer really wants, he can give an archival print so that stays in the box. Or you can find a solution in presenting or archiving, but it has to be in, in dialogue. I, I think this is now really quite challenging for us because I remember in the 70s, 80s, I don't remember, but we can see in our collection, what was more important was the visual information. So we, we, we bought a lot of portfolios with new prints. It was even more important sometimes than vintage prints. Now we are totally in this vintage adoration and we see that vintages are not, not perfect and they are not pyramids. They, maybe they don't, <laughs> but they don't will last for 3,000 years. So this is now maybe we have to accept the idea that we maybe we should keep the visual information and try to think about new forms, even if it's totally um, provocative for us conserving vintages at the best um, the best way. But <laughs> yeah, but th that's photography. This is just we have to accept it. And I think I would never replace something. You can add something new to the collection that gives with a different technique. And that's all, that also tells something about the technique of photography and how it is changing and how uh, uh, techniques that were used in the beginning will, you never knew what was going to happen. Well, now we do know, you, you don't know even all the archival digital prints that are being made now, who knows? For, to continue also with what you mentioned, the, the question of sustainability. So you, for each um, acquisition, you also raise the question if this is now how we can uh, preserve it and what does it mean for the collection. And I, for all, I think all, <laughs> we all have this question of storage, yeah? And we're also discussing at the Pompidou, um, 10, 20 years ago, we kept the artist frames and the works framed and now we question should we just keep the print and what is because it's such a, a huge there, question there's no with... space people we, we keep on building new uh, storage facilities and then the question is okay what kind of storage facility in a in photo museum already uh, five years ago we decided to buy a new storage facility that is energy low climate control so we're fluctuating with the seasons uh, in, our, uh, in our storage, which means that, of course, there are uh, parameters. Uh, it's between specific uh, degrees. But there's only a very small uh, um, climate installation. And if, the sea, if it would go too low or too high, then it starts working. But of course, it's some kind of bunker. Uh, the collection uh, people, they don't walk in and walk out, no. 
there's only one person every once in a while that can go in because we don't want to change the climate. But I think that will be the future because I think all the research that has been done on, uh, on, on, on temperature and relative hum humidity, things have changed. We don't need all these fridges for specific materials. Yes, I, I, I will not be too <laughs> radical. Eh? I'm, now I'm posting it very uh, radical, of course. Our negatives and our color prints are still in a cool storage that is fixed. But if something happens, if it breaks, the worst that can happen is like the big uh, change in temperature. If you have like a passive depot, you have it less. Um, I'm actually surprised that you say, okay, we are get ready. We are get rid of the the frames because I think in the last 20, 30 years, the frame has become. The initial part of the presentation yeah. and i mean there are certain works which of course can be stored in this kind of uh, a flat okay. paper uh, idea or so but that makes it difficult nowadays because in these storage places you cannot facilitate the best climate for the wood for the frame the c print has a has a temperature which would be desirable the metal the the, the glue so it's it, it's almost a kind of miracle uh, and, solution which has to be found. Uh, no, we don't throw away the frames. It's just if we maybe cool just the prints and keep the frames in a space which is not cool because it's so expensive, you know. To and, and for all these pics and the, and even the, the smaller prints, they, we couldn't put them out, have them in the in the in the cool space and have the frames elsewhere. But this is but we, we are just in the process of constructing new storage space and. It's a huge discussion because we know it's so so expensive to uh, cool down a space of more than 400 square meters this would be the case for our collection um maybe also just uh, i uh, a very important question we are here uh, at an art fair <laughs> so it's about acquisition it's about money and uh, i just mentioned the very importance of our friends so we have wonderful group of friends and they help us for many acquisitions and when we compare today i think two-thirds of our acquisitions are from private money and one-third is from public money and compared to the situation 30 years ago it's a total revolution even for a french institution which is very focused on the idea of the state that in a way gives the money and and so on what is what is what is what is in your case what is up in, in your in your institutions you know but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i can tell okay so basically we have also a, a friends organization around the photographic collection but we also have a foundation which is actually supporting the museum per se so within the museum we have two friend circles already and another one which is kind of uh, associated to the younger members which is not about collecting but they have different uh, format what it creates, and I think what that's quite important, is that it's not only the money part, which is, of course, maybe one motivation to support a museum, but for us, it's also to create a kind of social space or social life or so, and uh, treat something like bring the topic of photography closer to more people. And we can see that that it's kind of mixing up. Though. I mean, the, these groups are kind of coming to uh, the other events, and so and so that is the social part. And um, of course, we have these friend circles, but we also have a lot of foundations in Germany which we can approach. And without this, we would not be able to acquire bigger things. But on the other hand, the friend circle for me or for the photographic collection, this is a speedboat. This is the, the fast decision which doesn't have to go through many processes. We can be very quick to make a decision. So I think they all have different um, possibilities also. Yes, I, I think in our museum we are uh, funded for, by the city of Antwerp and Flanders, and actually we only get we are only state funded. We for the moment we don't have a, we're not using private uh, fundings for acquiring uh, works. I think that there are still a lot of uh, possibilities in this. This is something we we have a group of uh, patrons, and of course they they support us, uh, but not specifically for the acquisition of a, a collection artworks. I think looking at the future, uh, there will be things, I hope there will be things happening because we do have a budget every year, but I don't think I can compare it to maybe your budget, but there are still options to be uh, 
researched. So I hope that um, in the future more acquisitions will be possible because of uh, more private funding. Just uh, also um, a question, when you look now um, on the different acquisitions, what do you think, what is maybe the, 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 the number of contemporary artwork and the number of historical photography? Also, I, I would like to continue later this question of shared artworks. What, what is approximately your, how would you like to define, how, how can you, in a way, define the different, um, um, the, the amount of, of money and uh, of, of, of acquisitions? I, I think our biggest budget goes to contemporary acquisitions for the moment, because also the historical, of course, we have uh, gaps in the collection, but we can't afford to uh, fill these gaps because the prices are also different. So I think maybe 90% uh, or 80% is contemporary and the rest is um, historical. And with historical, we also have a focus for the next policy, policy period of 19th century focus female Belgian photography because we're also preparing an exhibition on that topic. Um, with us, it's a bit like, um, I would say, 70, 30 um, percent in general. And then we have a different method, actually, when bigger things appear. Like, for example, if there's an estate which is kind of coming around the corner and we know that there will be kind of finances be involved, we have to kind of get time to raise funds. I mean, it's not that it's there and we can just be like active, but it's more like it's a longer term plan. Uh, to put something uh, in, inside, and I think it's a bit like the Oyekere, uh, where you said it's a long-term project. Sometimes it's a couple of years until something can happen, or so. And and maybe because it's uh, really um, um, an issue very much discussed in in the United States. What is the role um, of the accession of your um, collections? Uh, are they protected or are you even interested to get rid of <laughs> and to sell artworks? I, I know it a little bit from, by, from the Volkwang, but what is, what is, what is, what is um, your realm of possibilities? Uh, well, the works in our collection are protected, so we can't uh, s sell them, but um, we are looking for, because we have a as I told you, we have more over 4 million objects in our collection. The biggest part, of course, are specific archives that came into the museum years ago and that maybe don't fit our current collection profile anymore. So we will not throw them away, we will not sell them, but we are for a few uh, uh, archives, maybe more cinema related. We are looking for new homes, so other museums that would be better suited, uh, but it's a very uh, complicated um, thing to do because you, you, you need to have everything uh, registered almost before you can gift it to somebody else. But of course, these are the typical archives that are not totally uh, inventorized. So we are, we, we are, for the next years, we have three uh, archives that are on the program to do research on how to find a new spot for them. At the moment, we don't deaccession, but I think it's more like the perspective for the future to say if we would have done in the past collecting like big bulbs or big uh, amount of images or so, it's more a kind of um, um, job uh, to, to address to yourself, to be more aware what you want to accept, what can you really be taken care of. And I think this is super important to do that in the moment where things enter the museum and not waiting too long to, to have that discussion. And maybe just also um, one idea that I mentioned and um, the idea of shared acquisitions. We, we are living in a, in a in now in times where we can share our knowledge and we can share cars and, <laughs> and so on. And I mentioned one acquisition and I would like to even to mention an historical example and um, because it's, um, I, I was working for the Volkwang and the Pompidou, and what in a way is something what, um, uh, what we can say for our two uh, collections. There, has, there, was a wonderful, there was a wonderful moment in 93, and it's also a tribute to Ute Eskelsen, who I saw sitting in the public, 
and to Alain Sayak, and they both had the idea to share a very important um, number of Laszlo Mohinoy uh, photograms. And I think it was the last time that an important body of work coming from the United States to Europe. Normally, you know, it's the other way around. And they shared his acquisition. And I, I think it could also be interesting because our colleagues from the new media department are doing this often with Christian Markley, the clock or others. Do we have this idea? But for photography, it's still something we, we, we could explore even further. And, and how do you do it then? Because I, I would also be interested. I think that's the future also, working together with other institutions. We don't all have to buy the same photographer because every museum looks the same then. So how do, what are the practicalities? I, I, think, I think digital works could be owned in co in co-ownership, so you have just to 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 discuss when <laughs> you could show you, you can't show it at the same time. Uh, but the other examples now, um, what I mentioned, it's really um, to mobilize people to say we have a project with the Centre Pompidou or with the Folkwang. Let's find partners and and then and then share a body of work and then to do an acquisition together and so on. I think this was really a wonderful example and I don't really remember of a very important um, group of work uh, <laughs> coming from, uh, being acquired by Euro European institutions from the United States. Um, you're right, but we uh, collaborated when I was still in winter tour, we shared uh, Yamanga, um, where a whole exhibition was actually divided between uh, Museum Volkwang at that time, Winter Tour at that time, and I think it was very clever also from uh, Jan after that exhibition tour to kind of say, I want to secure the exhibition as, as, as an entity, and he was able to say, okay, I'm giving it to two institutions. It was a very generous uh, 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 move from him to do that, but it's, again, it's both sides' responsibilities, which we are fulfilling, and this work is accessible for loans and uh, for future living actually yeah, yeah. good that you remind uh, yeah. <laughs> remind this so maybe this was one hour now and we have maybe uh, questions in 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 the public and uh, maybe i give you the microphone Is it? Yeah, it's on. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Paris Photo uh, and Florian for hosting this uh, exhibition, uh, this talk on museum practices, which is normally not a subject that we see a lot here. My name's Hester Kaiser, and I'm the curator of photography and new media at the Canadian Centre for Architecture in Montreal. And as such, I recognize a lot of the topics that you guys have discussed. And But I have three questions. One is for Tamara, really. Um, because we, as you do, we have a very colonial collection of photography and we're currently um, investing a lot of time and resources in what we call criti critical cataloging, where we go and revisit our archives, our collections and our descriptions to use different language to bring it up to standard. And it's very time intensive, but it's a very rewarding uh, exercise at the same time. And I was wondering in, to what extent uh, you do that. Um, the other uh, question is also because Florian talked about collaborative collecting is how do you think about post-custodial practices with, let's say, indigenous communities or communities in uh, places where there is no real museum infrastructure, no cooling, no air conditioning, but where you can facilitate and maybe help as a museum to preserve practices. We're currently discussing an acquisition where we could collaborate with a Cree community up in the north uh, to preserve one of their, um, or a, a large archive about their way of building and uh, working. Uh, but it's a very complex kind of discussion that takes a lot of years, but it would be uh, for us an, an, an experiment in this kind of post-custodial practices. And the last one is, um, how do you feel about collecting operational images that are not necessarily authorial. Armin gave a, a lecture last week in, uh, in the CCA and we talked a lot about operational images with him and 
Um, it's also something that as an architecture center, we have more chance and we run into those more often. And we're not author based in this way that you are so much, I would say. Uh, but we have a lot of this um, potential to get operational archives of, let's say, a company that produces radiators. Or we have the Cleveland Bridge and Air Engineering Company archives about building bridges. Um, so it's a very unauthorial position, which changes things for copyright and all those things. So that's for my three questions, each for one of you. Um, as for the first question, um, yes, we're actually doing the same uh, project as uh, you are describing. Uh, so we're looking, in, in the past, we have been looking at how uh, objects were described, which words were used. And now, actually, we just wrote a subsidy project for the next coming years, also together with other museums from the city of Antwerp, to do a big research, not only on... Um, the, the words that have been used, but also sensitive images, how are we going to deal with them? So it's something that we're very involved with and that we are, yeah, we're just at the beginning of the, the project, but it's, yes, I'm, I'm hoping in a few years to be able to tell you more about it, but yeah, that's, that's what every museum should do, actually. Yeah, thank you, Hester. Um, I'm gonna respond to the authoric uh, um, uh, archives. Basically, I would say, we are doing that since a very long time because when we are talking, for example, about journalistic photography, they were in a different mode when they were uh, when when they were created at that time. They had a different purpose, and then at a certain point, they aroused the interest and also the auth authorship interest that somebody was taking them serious as as images or so. So there is this kind of I would say transparency to accept that but probably also with a certain limit to say they only can be uh, 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 taken in, in consideration for an exception or as an example or so, because otherwise you are opening actually a new kind of museum in a way. Um, maybe also regarding the question of the operational images and maybe let me add even the vernacular images. This is a big question for us. And finally, we, we are thinking about artists who are in a way as a filters to these vernacular images. So they're often um, vernacular images filtered by artists or operational images coming with exhibition projects like the capital, um, uh, image capital project. But this is for us the only way in a way to let them enter the collection. It's difficult for us to go to the flea market and to come back with albums. But this is often really with, um, with, um, with, with the filters or with the works by artists who are uh, working on that. Yeah. And, and, and also your, your question how we can maybe also, um, when we did this acquisition of the Ochaker images, we also reserved a part um, for the copyright for the family because it was a French gallery and not the family. And we think to work on this um, collection also with colleagues from a Nigeria museum uh, to, 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 to work on the exhibition, to bring also the exhibition in a way back to, to, to Lagos. But these are um, really also new questions, even for, this, uh, for, the, for the Centre Pompidou, in a way to, to get, get rid of this idea, we are the Centre Pompidou, we do all these things now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, again, dealing with this uh, issue. Um, now, I'm going to be a little provocative here, but still, don't you think you still believe to the, you still belong to the analog world, in a world that's becoming more and more digital? In other words, where objects do not matter as much as their data. And wouldn't, again, uh, the digital future take care of the financial issues that you have, or at least some of them, in storing and buying. But also digital image, images you have to store and you also have to pay for the cloud and for all these things. So, of course, I think now we're on the brink of every museum, not only photo museums. We're all in between this analog world and the digital that we're only 
tasting. We're all having the same challenges and same issues, so we should work on that to find new visions on it. But, but storage, if it's analog or digital, we both have to pay for it. We, I, I, don't, I don't know yet what we will have to do, but these are very urgent questions. Actually, they were urgent a few years ago, and now we're still like, what do we have to do with it? We're already, it's already happening. So I can't give you an answer on that. I, I know that it's something that we have to find a, a vision or a strategies for, but uh, we're not there yet. Um, I would respond in two things. Uh, one, I would say, yes, we take the analog still um, uh, as relevant. But on the other hand, it's also... The, out, uh, the outlook is that this will disappear. Anyways, it will disappear uh, as, uh, as a market thing and then it's not available for artists anymore to produce in this kind of things. So we have to look ahead what will happen. And if you now saw some examples here, this is a testing ground for all of us. We, are, we have to constantly learn and we also have to unlearn certain things. And I think this is um, uh, an issue. We have to be flexible and we have, uh, uh, we have a mission to kind of consider the past and the present, the analog and the digital. The field has become much more wider, I would say. Um, yeah, I think this, is, uh, this resumes quite well. I even think that the sensibility for the materiality of things are, is even getting more and more important. What we are presenting now are these new challenges, but we also, in a way, um, I, I think this maybe makes it invisible what we are doing about preservation of the analog form of photography. But it's true, we have to face uh, these questions of fading away material and how we can deal with business in the future. Okay. Um, and then, uh, yeah, <laughs> just, just because I'm getting many questions regarding the Centre Pompidou uh, last moment. So we are open today, tomorrow on, on, on Sunday, no, no strike before Monday. So please, um, because, and we also have an interesting talk next uh, tomorrow um, by Estelle Blaschke and Armin Linke at, uh, at 7 about the new um, technologies like mid-journey and uh, these new ways of generating images is a very much discussed debate. So tomorrow at seven. Uh, Sally Stein with a question. <laughs> It's on. Okay, I was told today that on Saturday, because it's November 11, the armistice holiday, all state museums are closed. Is this not true for Pompidou? This, this is not true. This is not true. Misinformation. Fake, fake news. news. Fake news. So. Thank you. Yeah.